the ceiling and breathe normally. All right, interface is active and we're at full power. As human beings, we only ever experience one singular perspective in our lifetime. We see through our own eyes, hear with our ears, and understand the world around us with our brains. But Brandon Cronenberg's Possessor somewhat turns this on its head by centering its narrative on an assassin who kills their targets by taking control of other, real human bodies and using them as the killers. So although the true assassin may look like this and go by the name of Tasia Voss, she also looks like this. This and can theoretically take on any body necessary for the operation, provided her team can embed the required implant in a person's head to facilitate the possession. Beyond the jumble of perspectives these give Voss, her challenge as a covert assassin is to assimilate into these new bodies, taking on their personality traits and ticks as she goes. This brings an entirely new perspective to the issue of disembodiment, pairing it with the idea of manufactured identities. Brandon Cronenberg himself has mentioned how central this theme is to the film, explaining, The movie is about how we commonly manufacture identities and maintain them through dishonesty. I might have to fly out again. I thought they were giving you a break. Yeah. Uh, something's come up. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be breaking down Possessor Uncut, the mind-bending body horror roller coaster that only a Cronenberg could invent. But before we go further into the themes, let's get to grips with the film's brain-shifting narrative. Taking place in an alternate past, the film revolves around the troubled assassin Tasia Voss and the mysterious covert agency that she works for. Voss is essentially an experienced assassin with quite a reputation. However, her health and mental state are starting to be eroded by the psychological trauma of the hits. You're not safe for them anymore, are you? You told me yourself you'd become a danger. Did I say that? When we first meet Voss, she's in the body of Holly, within which she commits a horrifically brutal murder. But she fails at the final hurdle, being unable to disconnect from the host body, an act which is usually done by shooting oneself in the head. Once out, Voss goes through a debriefing to ensure that she can return back to her old personality. This comes in identifying three objects that are always the same. A pipe, a pin butterfly, and one we as the audience never get to see. When she looks at the butterfly, she mentions how she still feels guilt for killing it and pinning it as a child. I killed and mounted it one summer when I was a girl. Then I felt guilty about it. I still feel guilty about it. It's worth noting here how suspiciously similar the pipe looks to the pipe pictured in Magret's painting, The Treachery of Images. The painting highlights the divide between the painted pipe's visage and the fact that it's not a real pipe. This becomes especially meaningful for Voss's various embodiments because the body she finds herself within are not hers, begging the same question as a painting of what truly makes up the object of a person. Voss returns home, struggling to get back to her own personality. She spends some time with her divorced husband and child, but is unable to disconnect from work, with the psychological effects of brutal murder taking its toll. But instead of taking time off to recover, she jumps back into a new job straight away. Her handler, a retired assassin known as Gerda, welcomes this as she's fully aware that personal connections make these embodiments more difficult. While seemingly non-threatening, the heartless, cold and expressionless Gerda is revealed to be just as, if not more efficient than her disciple. I don't think there's any left. Sad news? I don't think there's any left. You want to get dinner? You want to get dinner? Uh, I'm sorry, I rather not go home. Uh, you can stay here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Voss's next hit is the wealthy CEO John Pass and his daughter Ava, and her in is the daughter's fiancé Colin. Colin also works for Pass's company, where employees spy on unwitting individuals in their apartments through virtual reality headsets and identify the products that they buy in their home. When we finally meet John, we're all of course expecting him to die, not just because he's the target, but because Sean Bean is betraying him. But alas, the hit doesn't go down as anticipated, with Pass surviving, and Voss, again, being unable to shoot herself in the head. Because of this failure, Colin's mind begins to take back control, and the two of them have a mental tug of war, resulting in a handful of deaths. As their minds begin to fuse more and more, Colin becomes privy to some of Voss's memories, which take him to her family home in search for answers. I need to know. I need to know what she's done to me. Do you understand? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Tell me what this is about. Maybe I can help. 
This uncanny moment bridges the gap between Colin and Voss's lives, as he holds Voss's husband at gunpoint, eventually hacking him to death with a cleaver. But remember, Voss is still within Colin's body at this point, making this moment all the more grotesque. Voss's son then comes down and finally kills Colin with a stab to the throat, but Colin retaliates and shoots the boy through the skull. As Voss ejects from the system and returns to her own body, she finds Gerda next to her, who reveals that she's taken control of Voss's son in order to finally get her out of the body. They then go through another debriefing with the same pipe and butterfly. However, here Voss finally reports no feelings of guilt for killing it, meaning she has now become the perfect, cold-hearted assassin that Gerda had always wanted. As we establish, the question of identity runs through this entire mind-bender of a narrative, with Voss constantly struggling to get into any of her characters, whether that be Colin or even herself. My darling. My darling. My darling. My darling. God, I, I am absolutely starving. I am absolutely starving, my God. Mum! My darling. We have food. Good, I'm absolutely starving. This connects to a widely discussed sector of philosophy known as self-knowledge, which is essentially how we understand ourselves through the unique information that only we are privy to, such as thoughts, internal feelings, and mental states. Since at least the 17th century, philosophers have generally agreed that our knowledge of ourselves and how we acquire it differs greatly from the way that we receive knowledge about the external world. The key feature here is known as the distinctiveness of self-knowledge, and relates to how we only get this information from a secure, first-person perspective, which is relatively unverifiable by external sources. This resonates with all the characters in the film, as it does with us in real life. But most interesting, in the case of Colin coming to terms with his mental state, knowing that there's another mind taking control of his body. Colin even attempts to describe this bizarre knowledge to Voss's husband, explaining through an analogy of a parasitic worm in the brain. Do you ever worry about parasites? One day your wife is cleaning the cat litter and she gets a worm in her. And that worm ends up in her brain. And it makes her do certain things. Predator things. Are you really married to her? Are you married to the worm? But more subtly, we can find residue of this struggle to understand the individual nature of self-knowledge when Voss first embodies Colin. We see her grab an apple and cut it exactly as she had done at her ex-husband's home, and Ava quickly notices something is not quite right about Colin, exclaiming, What's with you today? You've gone strange on me. This, of course, highlights the fact that we're so well and unconsciously aware of the behaviour of our loved ones, but it also reveals the fact that despite spending hours watching Colin to understand his temperament, from how he moves to how he speaks, Voss was still without Colin's self-knowledge, which is necessary to perfectly embody him. Thus, instead of seamlessly becoming Colin, Voss's Colin becomes this uncanny shell which is somewhere between their two personalities. This discussion arises even earlier in the film, when Voss is questioned about why she killed the first target with a knife instead of with the gun that was provided. Well, maybe it just seemed more in character. But Gerda, with all her experience, has a more probing response. Whose character? This changes our line of inquiry and suggests that despite embodying other people, Voss is in fact not privy to any new self-knowledge as she remains her own personality, simply controlling other bodies through the neural link. Throughout the film, there are some interesting virtual reality devices, both in terms of design and concept. The mask which is placed over Voss's head in order to possess her targets, and the headset Colin is forced to use at his virtual workspace. Within both of these instances, the characters experience a strange dislocation of themselves. Voss suffers the physical and psychological strain of being caught in another's mind, and Colin has a violent visual episode, sparking the appearance of those bizarre floating particles that signal the crack in Voss's control over his body. Both of these point towards real-world complexities with virtual reality devices. Researchers have suggested that one of the most unique facets of virtual reality is the sense of embodiment users report. In a paper titled Sense of Embodiment in Virtual Reality, they broke this down into three components, sense of self-location, sense of agency, and sense of body ownership. It's fascinating then that in Possessor, these are the three key struggles we see between Colin and Voss as they tussle for control over Colin's body. The agency shifts back and forth, resulting in the various deaths, which is directly tied to the sense of bodily ownership and the ability to locate oneself within the body. Pairing this with Voss's lasting psychological effects from using the device to commit murder, as seen by the intermingling of her reality at home and the visual effects which hark back to the murders, we reach another argument that virtual reality may have a truly profound effect on a user's thoughts, beliefs, and experiences outside of the device. 
I mean, researchers have already shown a similar phenomenon with literature. Reporting that readers are strongly identified with a fictional character may be more likely to replicate the actions of that character. As such, it's clear that Possessor's themes of the virtual embodied experience leeching into how we perceive the real world, in fact, isn't so far-fetched. After Colin and Voss murder Voss's ex-husband and are taken out by the boy, not only are we left completely cold as an audience, but so is Voss. As she returns to her body, next to Gerda's, she realises exactly what's happened, but her emotions are withheld. They move on to the debrief as before, but this time, Voss doesn't express any guilt for the killing of the butterfly, solidifying her as the cold-hearted killer required to follow in Gerda's footsteps. This moment is especially grim, as it completely circumvents the need for Voss to return to her old personality. All her emotional ties from the real world, her husband and son, have been severed. So what would be the point in rehearsing how she speaks anymore, when there's literally no one left to know or care who the real Voss is? The countless embodiments of different personalities and identities have done the opposite of what one might think. They haven't created a rich tapestry of personas, they have wiped Voss totally clean of personality, even removing the links to her own past, and in doing so, laying the foundations for Voss to excel as the perfect possessor.